What's up plant lovers, I'm Devin Walleen and in today's video I'm actually going to be talking about growing native plants, particularly along the eastern part of the United States, North America. Um, so don't be fooled, I'm in my, my house plant room full of tropical plants, uh, but in this video I'm going to be going through 40 different uh, native plants that are going to be native to um, anywhere from the uh, northeast part of the United States to the southeast and also in the uh, Midwest area. Now as I garden more, I'm, I'm actually gardening here in Westchester, Pennsylvania, zones 6, it's like zone 6B, 7A. Um, and as I grow more plants outdoors in my garden, um, it has become increasingly apparent to me the importance of growing native plants in our gardens, no matter where you live. Finding plants that are native to your region, it has a multitude of benefits. Number one, uh, native plants are going to be more apt to grow well in your soil, in your climate. They're also going to help pollinators and wildlife that are native to your region. Typically, they mean less maintenance because um, since they are you know, acclimated to your climate, that generally means less irrigation, less soil amendments, things to that nature. Um, but also, native plants just tend to look better in our gardens because they have the, the correct energy, the correct um, ambiance for your garden settings. I'm gonna be starting with herbaceous perennials and then moving on to shrubs. So let's get right into the list. So the very first one that I wanted to talk about is Echinacea purpurea. Uh, there's lots of different cultivars, varieties out there of the beautiful coneflower that is native to North America. These plants, they produce their beautiful flowers in the summertime. Um, they're great for the pollinators in the summer and then they feed a lot of birds in the wintertime with their seed heads. Now, as I go through this list, I will be putting up the genus and species of what I'm going to be talking about. You do want to make sure that you are growing the correct species, which is that second word uh, with a genus and species, uh, because the species is very specific to a region. There can be a genus that has certain species native to North America, while other species within that genus might be native to Europe or China. So this is a jump, this video is about uh, creating a jumping off point. You will want to go and do a little bit more investigations if you enjoy um, one of the plants that I am showcasing here in this video. Now the next plant would be the Rudbeckia, the Black-Eyed Susan. In particularly, I love the cultivar called American Gold Rush and it produces this beautiful blanketed effect of these golden flowers in the autumn time. Um, really, when we are transitioning from that summer to the autumn garden, you cannot have a beautiful native garden without some black-eyed Susans. Now one of my favorites for the shadier gardens would be the Heuchera coral bells. There's a few different species out there native to North America. Lots of different cultivars. You can get colors of you know uh, plums and uh, purples and caramels and greens and peaches, lots of different colors come in the coral bells. And depending on how cold your winters get, they may even stay evergreen year round. I get a little bit of dieback on mine here in Westchester, but uh, then they quickly regenerate in the spring, providing beautiful colorful foliage in the shadier areas of the garden. Now, one of my favorite ground covering plants would be geranium maculatum. This is a little bit of an aggressive geranium if given the right settings, which sometimes if you have a woodland garden, um, this is that's what you want. You want plants that are gonna be a little bit aggressive so that they can cover that forest floor. And geranium maculatum does just that. If you want a cultivar that's a little bit, that plays a little bit more nicely with friends without getting overly aggressive, check out the cultivar Espresso. It has a little bit darker foliage. Now I'm here in the middle of June and a plant that is beautifully blooming in my garden right now would be Coreopsis lanceolata. I grow a cultivar called, uh, I grow a cultivar from the series of the solar series. Now one quick point, there has been a lot of research as to whether cultivars of a specific genus are going to produce as much you know, pollen and nutrition for the pollinators and wildlife as the strict straight species does. 
Uh, many times the straight species will produce a little bit more benefit for the wildlife, but the cultivars might produce a little bit more showy flowers, beautiful flowers, more uh, garden worthy plants. So it's always a trade off. Um, and you know, when it comes to the Coreopsis, I just love the rich colors of the solar series. So that's what I grow. Um, and you know, while I plant plants for the pollinators and the wildlife, I also plant plants for my own benefit. I derive a lot of, a lot of pleasure and benefit just from seeing that beauty. So it's something to think about. The next one would be Iris Versicolor. Now this is an Iris specifically that grows well in wetter settings. Um, I love the cultivar Purple Flame. This was uh, created by a local botanical garden called Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. If you live in the area and you're looking for some real native plant inspiration, you gotta head to Mount Cuba Center. Much of this video has been inspired by uh, me visiting that garden and taking courses from the wonderful teachers over there. So now another plant perfect for sunny, wet, moist areas would be Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower. Some of the showiest, richest red colored blooms you have ever seen. The hummingbirds go crazy for this plant. So if you have an area that tends to stay moist in the sun, you should consider planting this and watch the all of the pollinators, particularly hummingbirds, come to your garden. For me, a plant that I've recently been growing is the Achillea millifolium, which is uh, also known as yarrow. I have a few different colors. I love terracotta, uh, paprika. Um, there's a few different beautiful colors of the yarrow that you can grow, and they're great in hot, sunny, dry garden beds. Now, at this point, many of us are aware that the monarch butterfly population has been severely decimated over the last 20 or 30 years. And um, a one plant genus that is, uh, you know, the very best for helping the monarch population would be the genus Asclepius, the Asclepius incarnata, specifically the cultivars Ice Ballet and Cinderella. Those are Asclepius um, that are great for moisture areas. And then the Asclepius tuberosa, which produces the orange flowers, is great for drier, sunnier areas. And the reason that these are helpful for monarch butterflies is that this is, this is the only plant genus that the monarch butterflies will lay their eggs. Uh, for some reason or another, the monarch eggs will only eat the foliage of Asclepius. So without these plants in a garden, you you really cannot help the monarch population um, come back to life. So now there's a few species of Baptisia that I absolutely love. Now this plant is great because it's extremely long lived. It's all, you know, a lot of herbaceous perennials may only last three to five years. This guy is gonna last decades. But the other reason that I love it is that this is a nitrogen fixing plant. It's from the pea family. So what that basically means is that it will actually help improve the structure of your soil for all the surrounding plants in that garden bed simply by existing in that garden bed. It fixes nitrogen, adds nitrogen back into the soil, which is really incredible. And then you get the added benefit of beautiful foliage and really richly colored flowers. It takes a few years to really get established, but once it does, it's gonna be bringing beauty year after year after year. Now I love the dainty flowers of the columbine, aquilegia, canadensis. They bloom in the early spring. Their gorgeous lobed foliage is just one of the very prettiest foliage in the garden. It's great in moist areas and drier areas and it can do well in pretty sunny conditions, but also relatively shady. It's very versatile. It will self seed. There's recently been a name change. Asters are no longer asters. There's Symphyotrichum is the new genus, but there's a lot of different American asters and, and you got to have some asters when we're growing our gardens, whether it's native or not, we want to have plants that produce flowers at different times of the year. 
and many of the asters, most of the asters will produce their flowers in the autumn time as our summer bloomers are finishing up. That's when the asters really come into play. Now, I was just taking a course over at Mount Cuba Center and one plant that they really have uh, on display right now is the Penstemon uh, Blackbeard and Midnight Masquerade. It's a Penstemon with dark foliage and beautiful pink blooms. Um, this native also just uh, uh, provides a, a lovely addition to any herbaceous perennial border. Um, and I love that dark foliage contrasting with those pink blooms. Now another divine mid-spring bloomer would be Dicentra eczemia, the bleeding hearts. The foliage is gorgeous and with when those flowers start to uh, bloom and those little you know dangling hearts are in flower it's just something special. It means spring is you know really arriving I and mean, it's time to be back in our garden. And these are also decade-long living plants. Now if you want a native that still brings some tropical energy consider hibiscus most the swamp mallow, yes, called swamp mallow because it does love moist conditions. But they, you can find, uh, you know, the, the straight species of flowers are going to be decent size. But there's lots of different cultivars with huge flowers, um, and they're still going to provide a beautiful benefit for our pollinators. Um, I love the honeymoon series, the summerific series. There's lots of different series out there: reds and pinks and whites and a lot of it in between. Now, not only do we want plants that are going to provide flowers throughout the year, we also want plants that, you know, have different forms. Liatris in particular, I love Liatris spicata. It provides a nice vertical interest with those flowers that are, you know, those uh, fuzzy purple upright flower spikes and then you have sort of a grassy um, foliage and it just creates a gorgeous prairie energy and these ones are also quite long lived as well. One of the absolute pollinator favorites would be bee balm, uh, Monarda. There's a, a number of different um, species out there. Most gardeners will find cultivars of the Monarda didyma species, and um, it's definitely the most uh, widely available. Pinks and bubble gums and purples and reds and uh, lots of different shades in between. Some that grow tall, some that grow shorter, and the bees absolutely love them. When you are shopping for your Monarda, though, make sure you look for um, spe uh, series that are mildew resistant. That's going to uh, provide plants that don't get that mildewy look on their foliage, which we don't want that in our garden. Now another plant that can be a little bit thuggish at times if given the right conditions but might be the right plant for certain situations um, would be Solidago goldenrods. These plants, they, they're another, you know, goldenrods and asters, they go hand in hand, particularly if you get a purple aster with the, you know, all, all Solidago, all goldenrods are, are golden. So, you know, that contrasting look is beautiful in the garden. Um, there's a, a, quite a few different species different heights, different spreads, um, different flower forms. So do now one case where the cultivar might actually outperform the straight species would be Phlox paniculata gina. These, you know, there's lots of Phlox paniculatas with huge flower heads. The gina has smaller flowers, but a profusion of blooms. The flowers smell like heaven and they are noted to really bring the pollinators in um, and you know uh, very long lived very winter hardy i love the gina i'm uh, you know hoping um, that my family we bring the gina into our uh into our lineup of plants that we offer at our, from our nursery um, because i really want to get some of these in, planted in my garden now, one plant that's gotten a little bit of, um, you know, uh, press coverage over the last couple of years would be Pycnanthemum, the mountain mint. This is part of the mint family, very low maintenance, um, highly desired by the pollinators, beautiful fragrant foliage, and um, it can be a little bit aggressive as well, but, you know, it does look great in a really natural native planting. Now, another plant that's great for the hot, sunny, dry garden beds would be sun drops, uh, Onothera fruticosa, gorgeous yellow flowers, um, produces this nice sort of bedding look, um, and it does really well in those very sunny conditions. 
Now one iris that's gonna do great in a little bit shadier areas and a little bit shorter than typical iris would be Iris Cristata. There's a couple different cultivars with large flowers, uh, really rich colored blooms. They're great in woodland settings and even um, rock, rocky rock garden settings as well. A, a different iris than many of us grow. Now, if you're looking for a great ground cover, consider Pachysandra, not that Pachysandra, not the invasive one. This is Pachysandra procumbens. This is actually native to North America. It's not gonna be as aggressive as that uh, invasive Pachysandra, but it, as a native, it's going to look gorgeous and it will provide you with a beautiful ground covering, uh, which is so important. Now, one plant that I am excited to get my hands on would be Heliopsis, both the uh, burning and bleeding hearts. Um, this is a plant that's great in those sunny, loving conditions and um, with that classic aster flower form, some of the most saturated, colorful flowers I've seen in a while. So definitely something I'm gonna be adding to my hot, dry sun gardens. Now, when we're talking about native plants, we cannot forget about ferns, tons of different ferns that are native to North America. I have planted a ton of Anaclea sensibilis, which is the sensitive fern. I'm not really sure why it's called that because it does grow beautifully well. It's not sensitive at all. It handles pretty much anything. And then another one would be the cinnamon ferns, the um, Osmunda genus. Uh, if you want a really natural energy with a plant that does not get eaten by the deers, you got to go with ferns. Those two is just, you know, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to native ferns. Now another very natural looking plant would be Carex or the sedges. Um, there's a saying, uh, there's a Carex for every garden and it's so true. Whether you have moist shade, dry shade, uh, moist sun, dry sun, there's a Carex for literally every single garden situation. And when you start adding this in with your other perennials, it really creates this wonderful harmonized effect. So I've really started to grow a lot more carrots. I just, I kind of dot them in between the perennial, other perennials in the gardens, and it eliminates the need for mulches and just really creates this full feeling in the garden. Definitely something that if you want to get that, you know, no mulch uh, garden bed, consider adding some sedges to your flower beds. Now, another kind of crazy looking plant would be the Aruncus di dioicus, the goat's beard. This is perfect for the shadier uh, settings in the garden. They grow pretty tall. They have this wonderful wild flower. Um, it's just a, a beautiful native, and I'm also looking to add some of those to my woodland garden uh, over the next couple of months. And one last category within the, the herbaceous perennials would be grasses. I need a lot more experience to really have some definitive comments on this one, but um, there's tons of grasses that are native to this area. Uh, one that I do love is the Calamagrostis uh, canadensis. It's a very natural, very, you know, consider planting this along the exterior of your gardens, um, along the fence line, watch it sway in the wind. Uh, that's what I love. This is a cool season grass, which means it's going to start growing earlier in the season um, and produce those uh, seed heads uh, in the kind of summertime. All right, so now that we've gone through our herbaceous plants, let's talk about shrubs and vines. I'm not gonna get into trees because um, that should be its own video in and of itself. If you need some tree recommendations, just look you know, oaks is a good, great place to start. Now, the first plant would be Lanisera sempervirens. This is the native honeysuckle. It's not one of those invasive, nasty invasive honeysuckles. This is the native one that produces beautiful red blooms that the hummingbirds absolutely love. Um, I really am uh, excited to bring the, ma the cultivar Major Wheeler into my garden. Uh, it's noted to have the mo biggest profusion of flowers, so that's a great cultivar of our native honeysuckle. Now, a hydrangea that I have a bunch of in my garden would be hydrangea arborescens, sometimes called the smooth hydrangea, sometimes called the tree hydrangea. Um, I grow the Invincible Ruby because it has beautiful ruby uh, pink flowers. Another one I'm looking at is the Incredible Blush. Uh, a lot of the um, typical smooth hydrangeas will have white flowers, but either way, white or pink, it's a very natural looking hydrangea that does excellent in our climate. 
Another hydrangea that's native to the eastern um, part of the United States, and particularly the southeast, would be hydrangea quercifolia. That is the oak leaf hydrangea. This is divine in the shadier gardens, uh, shadier areas of our gardens. Plant like 10 or 12 of them, produce just this beautiful oak leaf hydrangea hedge, uh, you know, or shrub border, and you will absolutely love it. One of the highest performing hydrangea quercifolias out there would be ruby slippers. I have a couple of these growing in my garden. Um, and you know, the lobed oak leaves, the beautiful big flowers, so cool, so great. Now, Clethra alnifolia, or um, the sweet bush, um, this is a, you know, the straight species can get pretty big. It provides a lot of substance. So if you need a large growing shrub that is just beautiful, produces sweet, fragrant blooms, uh, consider the straight species. But if you want a more um, smaller, smaller habited um, Clethra, consider ruby spice. I just planted one of these in my garden. It has ruby colored blooms, stays a little bit smaller. It does love the sun, but it also loves the moisture. So this is, you know, I planted it with those iris versicolor and they're doing fantastically growing together. Now, if you grow a lot of boxwoods and you want to replace it with something native, consider Ilex glabra. This is what I have growing around my roses. Yes, I'm not one of these guys that is, you know, a radical. I do plant things that are non-native. I love to have, you know, I'm trying to increase the amount of natives in my garden, but there are plants that I really want um, to have because I love them and roses would be one of them. But instead of doing a traditional rose garden with roses surrounded by boxwoods, I've substituted boxwoods boxwoods for this Ilex glabra and it has that same sort of effect but it grows better in my garden and it is more impervious to pests than that than boxwoods tend to be. So there are things that we can replace, um, things that we've traditionally grown, we can replace them with natives. Now another meat and potatoes kind of shrub would be Itea virginica. They are long-lived, high-performing, beautiful flowers, pollinator magnets. Um, they'll get a little bit large, maybe four uh, feet tall and wide. If you want a little bit of a smaller um, cultivar, consider Henry's Garnet, uh, or Little Henry. That one stays a little bit more compact, so if you have a smaller garden and want a native shrub that's high-performing, try that one out. We cannot forget about winter color. Winter interest, it can be hard to achieve, but one of the best plants to do so with would be Cornus sericea, the red twig dogwoods, um, because they produce red twigs, like the, the structure of the plant um, will be beautiful red in the winter time. Um, it is so pretty, uh, and I have a couple of them in my garden, and um, it, there's really nothing like seeing that red in the middle of the winter time. Now one plant I just added to my garden was uh, the Nine Bark Amber Jubilee. This is Physocarpus opu opulifolius um, and these are another just high performing gorgeous shrub perfect for the shrub borders for the back of the borders they work well uh, you know the uh, tiny wine and uh, amber jubilee both have some darker foliage so having contrasting colorful foliage in a garden setting is always a great way to add interest. We don't want all one color of green. We want to get some different tones in there. So most of us would be familiar with elderberry, Sambucus canadensis, um, elderberry. They produce phenomenal foliage on these shrubs, you know, the, that can get quite large, uh, but they will also produce berries. You know, there's lots of different uses for them. Uh, humans use them, uh, birds and wildlife use them. So a lot of times I like to plant plants that produce berries, even if I'm not going to be consuming them, um, for the wildlife to consume. And these kinds of plants are going to, you know, really bring our native wildlife into our gardens, which is such a beautiful thing to do and enjoy hearing all the different birds. Um, it's just so fun. Now another plant that fits along those lines would be Vaccinium corymbosum. This is the high bush 
uh, blueberry. Um, I have three of these growing out in my garden. Uh, I never get the blueberries. The, the birds always seem to do so first, but I don't care. I, that's why I planted them. And the blueberries, they produce the beautiful berries in the late spring, early summertime. And then the plants will turn uh, gorgeous colors in the autumn time as well. So this is another multi-season interest shrub that you can grow in your garden. Not just necessarily for the food, but that's just an added benefit. Now, one gorgeous, uh, I haven't touched on a lot of evergreens, but one such would be uh, the Southern Bayberry Morella uh, Serifera, or also the Morella uh, Pennsylvanica. This is an evergreen shrub, provides a wonderful substance in the garden. This is a type of plant, plant it along the, the sides of your house that you're trying to cover. That's what I've done. Um, uh, if you have a large garden bed, plant this in the middle. It can provi provide beautiful structure. And the fact that it's evergreen um, just as, you know, makes it even better. And last but not least, I would say, you know, the, the king of the um, native shrubs would be uh, viburnums. Uh, we have viburnum dentatum, um, which I always forget the common names. Let me refer, uh, viburnum dentatum, arrowwood, viburnum nudum, possum hop, not sure what that really refers to. If you do, let me know. Um, and then viburnum black hop. I also don't know what that common name really refers to, but what I do know is that all three of those species of viburnum are fantastic shrubs, um, multi-season interest. They, you know, they're gonna provide you beautiful foliage. Many of them will provide uh, a changing of the foliage colors in the fall, uh, flowers in the springtime and early summertime. Um, some of them even produce berries for uh, the wildlife. Viburnums are one of the best genus of native plants that we can add to our gardens. Wow. That was a lot, that was a mouthful. A lot of beautiful native plants. I hope you were inspired. When you hear about growing native plants, don't be overwhelmed. It's simply, you know, as the, the wonderful uh, professor in my region, Doug Tallamy, has said, it's, it's all about bringing nature home. Um, so by planting natives, we're bringing nature home. We're, we're living more closely connected with Mother Nature, helping the local, the, the native wildlife and the pollinators, planting plants that are suited for the energy of our garden settings, um, and typically planting plants that are lower maintenance. It's just wins and wins and wins. Uh, less fertilizers that need to be used. Um, so hopefully this list is a great jumping off point to get you inspired, give you some ideas. Maybe you saw plants that you can fill in into your garden beds uh, this year or next year um, whenever works for you. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, subscribe to my channel, Plant Vibrations. We bring in new plant related videos every single week. Thanks for joining me here in this growing community on Plant Vibrations. I'll catch you guys real soon. Ciao.